Larry, you want to give us about a two-minute dissertation as to what took place at the board meeting? No more than two minutes. Well, I don't really, I don't have much more than a minute, Al. Okay, let's have that minute work. I'll give a minute back. It's still about the same. We talked about the uh, uh, same old thing we normally talk about. Uh, but uh, the, the one thing that I did write down is that uh, we, uh, we, uh, we changed insurance companies. Uh, insurance is still about the same, though. And uh, our treasurer is uh, now at uh, 5,843, seven, uh, 21 cents. And uh, that's until we start getting uh, memberships uh, monies in, and it, that should go up. And we talked about the fact that uh, uh, the check that uh, was sent out uh, to you, uh, it was sent back, but then we uh, we all agreed to return it back to you. So you'll, you'll get a check for the, uh, for the Zoom. And that's about it, Al. Okay. Um, our next meeting is August the 17th. And our topic will be Google Maps. Joe Nowak will be the will give us a discussion. Our September meeting uh, is to be announced. We don't have a we don't have a program yet for September. Uh, our October meeting, uh, Vicky Vicky Pinoza is going to give us a an overview of Libra Libra Office, uh, or at least illustrating the differences between or the similarities between. LibreOffice and Microsoft Office. And that will be for the October meeting. Uh, we don't have a September meeting yet, a uh, speaker yet, but as soon as we get one, we will announce that. Okay, any comments from anybody else? Any announcements that we ought to think we ought to know about? Anybody have a baby or get married or, um, and divorce is in, uh, uh, <laughs> Is well, yeah. well, let me let me ask a question about just the group. I mean, I got an email within the past week or so about some senior senior meetings, and I'm not sure if that I got that because I've attended some of the ACE, APCUG meetings. But I think you got it because you attend the. Um, CCS meeting. Huey, that's, that's, would you give us a two minute dissertation on what that's about? Not sure which one he's talking about, what he got. Oh, well, one, one was a senior. One at a time, guys. I, I got two items. One was about the senior meetings, and the other one was um, here's another, and it named some other city uh, CCS group as if we were maybe invited to those. I, I, mean, I kind of didn't know what was going on there with these two emails. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So seniors in Oklahoma, what is all that all about? APCUG. Well, let's not get, get too deep in that. Can you hang on to that until after our presentation? Sure. When we have a, a general discussion, we want to get into our presentation as quickly as we can so we don't... Okay. Uh, Okay. Okay, and, and then I'll talk about tech for seniors. Sure. Thanks, Huey. Okay, any other comments, real quickly? Anybody? Jane Smith coming in. Okay. Okay, we're going to start our meeting. We're turn the floor over to uh, Bert Good, who's going to give us our presentation for tonight. Bert, it's all yours. Okay, let me uh, clear this out here. Okay. Um, good evening. Um, I'm uh, happy we had a chance to get together to talk about a lot of things. Has anybody here ever worked for Hewlett Paper? I'll we'll speak up here. Okay. Um, 
Let me take care of a few things here. How do I get this closed? Okay. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Um, Mike, can you see my uh, PowerPoint on your screen? You're on the air. Okay. So let's just start off over here. Um, I guess I'm not sure how to. I have the people showing on my screen, and I'm not sure where to take that off. All right. So, um, okay. Right now, I just wanted to point out that, uh, you know, we're um, part of the Chicago Computer Society. We've been uh, doing this since uh, 1984. And uh, many of you have been leaders in this to be able to do these kind of programs to support people using computers to. Uh, survive, I guess is the best way to put it. A little bit about my background. Um, I've been a member of CCS since 1991, held various leadership positions, and board of directors, president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, education director, leader of the Access SIG, leader of Microsoft Office SIG and Chamber. You stop, Bert. You locked. <clears throat> I've uh, I've um, retired CPA. My, uh, it says my internet connection is unstable. Can you hear me? Well, yeah, you're on the air. Okay. Well, my you may have been warning me. Okay. Uh, as a CPA, I'm a retired uh, from the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. I've uh, been a CITP, which is Certified Professional Information Technology Professional. I'm past leader of the Illinois CPA Society uh, in various uh, events where we have 400 meetings a year. And we're, uh, I'm past leader of their PC user group. I've uh, presented in technology programs for about 35 years. Uh, I was a, a trainer at Microsoft Solution Providers, uh, 37 different PC courses, and I have been a Hewlett Packard VAR and developer uh, and uh, made custom solutions for their customers. Uh, and I'm a CPA consultant, to the, I've been a CPA consultant for the factory at Hewlett Packard and Microsoft. So that's just a little background. Um, I have a different philosophies in my experience about how things work. So it starts with, uh, we all have different experiences in technology growing up throughout our lives. Now, what does that mean? It means that um, <laughs> we're, let's see, we get this here. Yeah. Um, what it really means is that uh, everybody comes from a different place. We've all worked in different places. We've grown up with different experiences. Uh, and uh, so one of the things I wanted to do was to talk about my experiences and how I got involved in technology and why. Um, so almost everything we do today in our lifestyle is really about through handled through computers, whether we use a computer or not, because our lives are centered around it. Um, and what we have to do is understand that this isn't just about what happens today, but it's been evolving over generations and generations as one layer after another layer after another layer comes uh, to pass and adds on to whatever has happened previously. Uh, I picked up a little cartoon here that was uh, from How to Geek and um, it's, I'm writing a book on everything I don't know about technology. It's going to be longer than I originally thought. 
Well, as I started to prepare this, I went through and went through Wikipedia, which has huge amounts of information. Some isn't completely accurate, some is. So, all right, I see that uh, my screen right now isn't moving, but it was moving before, so we can't learn more. Let's, uh, each of these little things popped out in different places. All right. Take a look at this screen for a little bit. Seems to me that when we we're going up, we saw lots of things that told us that technology was going to come in the future. We had the Jetsons. We're almost there, but not quite. We had uh, Flash Gordon. We had the time machine. We had Star Trek. Once in a while, we would see a little robot that uh, would walk around a little bit. And then we started getting into looking at what on the far left bottom over here, we started seeing that robots have insights. And then they came out with a robot that seemed like she was really cute. And, but then when you look at the back of her, you see all the settings. But in the front, she looks pretty good. Although she didn't have any legs, they put her on legs a little bit here. So you could see that this wouldn't be so unreasonable to be acceptable as a um, robot in the society. Because we don't want the robots to look like this. We already have cars that are trying to be robots and drive themselves. We have Roombas and uh, automatic uh, lawnmowers. The, the whole concept of the dynamic robot that they made that runs around and dances is just uh, unbelievable, actually, because it, it works so well. We'll see how this keeps evolving in different ways. And then, of course, for the simpler things, we've got, um, you know, an iPad on a stick that rolls around and talks to you and can be you in any place. We've seen this lots of places along the way. So this is a vision of what we've been told technology is going to be. Science, fiction, and robots is what we have to look forward to, and it sets our expectation. So over in uh, Wikipedia, I asked what was going on. It said, technology is the application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes, especially in the industry for machinery and equipment developed from the application of scientific knowledge. And it includes advances in computer technology. Okay. As I look back through this concept of layering of information, over the ages, we you know, we take it all for granted because we were born and all this sort of existed. And imagine that our kids just take it all for granted as it existed. Except for the takeoff of uh, the uh, flight to the outer space this morning. Um, but back in the Middle Ages, you know, the big thing was... Uh, Lots of ways that people evolve. Uh, they really weren't, you know, there was no movement. Uh, people were just surviving. Uh, and then we got to the age of discovery where people started moving around and fighting with each other. And then came what they called the Industrial Revolution. So from 1760 to 1840, it's where things started to get made, people developed things. I mean, in a way, whether it was a wheel and a wagon or various <coughs> technologies that changed the way lifestyle worked. And then came 1880 to 1945. Now, I don't know what your experiences are, but my father and grandparents all lived in that age. And it was the age when uh, we probably had machines that were created. We weren't living in a lifestyle that was just surviving perhaps on a farm and making food for yourself. And, and we started having the ability to move around and the ability to make things for other people. 
was that of the concept of distribution, where cities were born, groups were born. And so all that came along with a number of wars. And it seemed like wars were the reason that people generated most technology. It would force people into a place, just like we're having today with the virus. It's putting people in a place where technology has to move forward as fast as possible to survive. But it isn't that, you know, whether we went to the atomic age or the digital age, it never ends. So there'll be another age, and because it never ends, you know, we or our children or grandchildren will all be part of it. Maybe that'll be going to Mars, who knows? Going back to the beginning, what accomplishments happened that brought things forward? I mean, in the beginning, people made clubs. They had rocks, they threw at people. They put rocks together to maybe make a place to live. They figured out how to use fire and cook food. They figured out, you know, maybe if they had an inclined plane, they could uh, make things easier. They made the wheel, they made wagons, they made steam. You started having water wheels and they started to appreciate metals. You had trading that started. You had discovery, traveling different places, sailing, you know, to be able to find new continents and people. All these things brought new things to be added on to the technology of the day. Sailing, how do you sail? Well, they had to create tools to be able to know where to sail. Nationalism, which unfortunately, perhaps leads to more wars than it should. And religion, everybody brings in the groups that they gather together and work together to be able to pass along the information. And yet technology expands every day. And now we're at a point where we think of ourselves as being in information overload. And when you think back how much when we were growing up, perhaps the amount of information that we had to learn that was out there to learn was extremely limited compared to those things that are available today. You know, we all talk about how you could put as much information on a watch today as you could could have had in any computer that not that far that long ago. We talked about that. This little stone right here reminds us that this was technology. This is where people wrote things down. This is a history. This is these are writing tables, and they were all chiseled. And we don't have to have chisels anymore. But it's interesting that it, that technology, of course, faded like many others. And we take it all for granted that we can talk to our computer, we can have our computer talk to us, we can type, we can write, we can do calligraphy if we want to make it fancier. But this was the calligraphy of the day. Going back to... Uh, getting things a little more forward. Grandparents generally were considered to be in the Industrial Revolution, 1880 to 1945. Lifestyle change from providing for yourself and your family to be part of towns and communities with manufacturing and distribution goods and services. The innovation speed was just something that was required because it was a necessity. Let me give you an example. In my father's lifetime, he was born in 1900. He lived a very long life to, 100, to 102 years to 2002. But I always could never imagine what it must have been like when he was a boy, because things were so different. As a boy, he helped his father deliver bread door to door on a horse and wagon for their bakery. Later, they moved to a farm in Indiana, and they cared for animals and plowed the fields with the horse. Over time, they sold the farm and moved to Chicago, where my dad attended college and worked a job writing letters. In this case, it was for her check and marks. And they, what they did is they sold suits. And in order to sell suits, 
they would have a tailor go down the railroad to stop railroad station stops and measure people for their suits to be able to order them. And he would write letters to tell the general store people along the tracks, here's the date and time that tailor will be there so you can get your customers online. Now, we don't think about that as being an issue anymore. Obviously, we can order online if we want it. But obviously, lifestyles change as time goes on. And the fact that there were even trains that could, you know, be the center of communication and technology and mar marketing right then is interesting by itself. Later, my dad and my mother started a used address address machine business. There's a little picture of an address address machine there in the corner. And they went ahead and uh, did something that computers do today. They made metal plates that would go in a machine that would type in with the name and address of somebody. And they would take a stack of those plates, put them through this machine, and it would print labels. You could put them on each envelope or they could print them uh, on cards and then uh, cut them up later and, and distribute them that way. That was how people did mailing lists. When I was growing up, that's how it was. Until computers came along and we were able to make labels on a computer, which changed the industry again with a new lifestyle. You think about what life was like from 1900 to 2002. <coughs> the best way to explain it is over that time came electricity, came lights, came telephones, came buildings with indoor plumbing, came automobiles, came trucks, planes, <coughs> trains, appliances, radio, TV, grocery stores, ready-made clothes, department stores, shopping centers, highways, tolls, smartphones, and computers, etc. Of course, they had one thing we don't have today anymore, and that was the Sears catalog that you see in the picture. When I was growing up, and I tried to look around and saw technology, I saw that uh, innovation was often the result of people taking existing things and putting together in new ways to make new innovations. And that's really been what the technology has been all along. And I'll go on for a little more of that later. In school, I had a home mechanics class where we learned about how to make light switches or how light switches work. And you basically, you had on and off, even made a lamp. But I started to understand a little bit more Communication came because of the telegraph. Remember, people, you did have telegraphs as an early means of communication, and they used Morse code. So you see next to it, Morse code. So Morse code was for the letter A, dot dash. So when I was in the Coast Guard Reserve, uh, that was one of the things you used to uh, have. Uh, we were supposed to have uh, experience with Morse code because ships weren't allowed to uh, use voice communication outside the U.S. territories. Later, that all got computerized as well. But that dish seemed like a standard that people could understand. And it, wor it worked with electricity the same as the on-off switch. Then we started to think a little more on standards. We went to technology and digital standards. So if you look at uh, more on-off switches, we took seven on-off switches and think of it as binary code. So understanding binary code, by the way, this is a binary clock that I have, uh, but basically, you have, you read from the right to the left, and you have a one, the first zero, first position is one, 
second position is two, third position is four, fourth position is 16, fifth position 32, sixth position 64, and the seventh position is 128. If you see a, a listing that says 0100001, now you have 64 plus one equals 65, and then in the binary code is sent to your computer is to understand that that means the letter A. So all that is is seven light switches put together. And all of our computers today start with that basis to be able to simply pass along electrical impulses, sometimes slower, sometimes faster, to be able to translate that into information we can understand at high speeds and accurately. Let's go further. Um, when I was growing up, it was right after World War II ended. Uh, it, you know, people started talking about computers, but in World War II, they, they had the INIAC computer, which was made of tubes. A tube was just an on-off switch. So what happened is they put an electrical charge in the tube, it held that charge until they released the charge, and that's the same as the on-off switch to be able to gather information. And generally, computers were just used to be able to figure out trajectories. There were big, fancy calculators to figure out trajectories uh, of where missiles or, or uh, um, various types of ordnance would be sent out. So, okay. Uh, by the way, these are people changing tubes. But over here, this is a picture of um, where is it? Uh, oh, I'm in the wrong place. Okay, this is a picture of Grace Hopper. Grace Hopper was one of the first people, she's working on, the INIAC, on a Unix mission, Uni, um, Unigraph, uh, not Unigraph, uh, a different major computer. And basically she was the first one who figured out programming languages to be able to give instruction sets rather than just wired instructions each time that they would have to change things. So she actually became a major officer in the Navy over there. Great happened. Moving right along. Um, So when I graduated grammar school, I was given a present of a transistor radio. The transistor radio at that time had two transistors, but there were no tubes. I mean, before then, you either had a crystal radio or you had tubes to be in a radio. And that was the beginning of these little buttons, which were transistors. Today in our computers, we have unlimited numbers of transistors, all built into chips to be able to make things work. And it becomes that same tool for on off switch. Moving right along. In my lifetime, I remember party line telephones without dials, dial phones, touch button phones, pay phones, cellular phones, flip phones, and now, smartphone. In my career goal of being an accountant, when I was growing up, I helped my dad in bookkeeping, and I had a hand crank betting machine shown me. Later, I went to college, and I learned about data processing and IBM computers. But of course, Roosevelt University, where I went to college, Accountants couldn't use computers at that time. They were only for IT people. But what I did find was there was a program in those days, we actually had courses that were taught on WTTW. And one was on data processing. And I watched every one of them and it became 
an understanding of how information technology data processing systems work. That got me interested in how the flow of data evolved through business systems. As a CPA, we used service bureaus, and which had mainframes and many computers to process the accounting reports. Reports usually took a week to be received. Only often we had to send them back because there were more corrections to be made. Of course, that didn't make the clients very happy because the reports were always late. Over that time, IBM was forced to let other companies make computers. So the mini computer industry was evolved, but they were still over $100,000, often many times that. So some solutions were done on systems that, you know, had a teletype. So you see there's a teletype. I remember people entered data for accounting systems and the teletype, which then went to a service bureau. And then they sent, in a couple of days, they sent the report back on that same teletype. Uh, if you look at the, over here, in this thing, this is a, a data entry station that eventually evolved from IBM, where people would type data in and it made punch cards. Punch cards were then used to be able to run through the system and read data. We'll talk a little bit about more how that works in a bit. The other thing that happened is this system over here was an HP 2000 system. I know they had one at uh, DePaul University, and it was a time sharing system. The concept of a time sharing system said, okay, uh, you put your data in, and multiple people can use parts of the computer at the same time and get an answer back. Now, it probably only could handle 20 people at a time, but it was something where before a computer could only do maybe one thing at a time. And then there was the other thing there. Data started to be able to move around because of the telephone. You didn't have to be there in person or pitch with wires, you could get a modem, in this case, a, a telephone, put into the modem, 300 board, and made analog sounds, which I'm sure any of you have heard before, which, of course, transferred the analog data of on-off switch, so to speak, information to, from one place to another. All right. Now, my background was evolved with Hewlett Packard at the time when it was just beginning. That's the Hewlett Packard garage um, up there in the top right corner here. Um, everybody wanted, you know, all the many, many companies were involved in trying to make computer systems. Some failed, some and on to be able to you know, go ahead and create other things. There was a lot of consolidation along the way. Uh, but Hewlett Packard was there before the, all this, making oscilloscopes. They were a major oscilloscope person, that, or a company that made tools for people for telephone systems, for all kinds of uh, Data information transfers to be able to control sound and wiring. At the time, they were in '73. They were a company that was about six hundred eighty thousand million dollars in terms of uh, yeah, in terms of uh, six hundred thousand dollars in terms of what they were doing in terms of sales. It was a small company. But they had a big catalog. By 1979, this catalog's an instant. But in this catalog, only one page was about computers. 
they were about all kinds of other technology equipment. Computers weren't even considered at that time. In the 60s, they decided, you know, they had all this equipment and people needed to be able to capture the data that this equipment was turning out. So you had something that would analyze blood gas systems. You had something that would, um, you know, control water flow. You had all these different kinds of systems, but they didn't want to just have somebody look at it on the screen or have it flow, or, you know, the data pass. They needed ways to be able to capture it. And so people started about trying to find different kinds of tools. So in the 60s, they started thinking about, well, what else, else is out there? Somewhere between 1964 and 66, they saw some companies were trying to develop four function calculators. Some were very successful. I remember seeing a sharp four function calculator for $800. And it was, you know, widely accepted as being wonderful. Other people had adding machines uh, that were being used in business, just not the hand crank anymore. But maybe it was electric and you didn't have to do the crank, you just push the button. And they still were doing basically four function, add, subtract, multiply, divide type capabilities. Somewhere in the, the 60s there, um, someone brought to the HP lab in Palo Alto uh, an idea that they had some information where they could have calculations that would be trigonometry and uh, quadratic equations in addition to the Ed's correct multiplied by. In effect, that would replace the concepts of a of a slide rule. And the problem was that they didn't know how to make such a device. Well, so the gentleman, and his name was Osborne, but I don't know if it's the same one who made Osborne computers, made a prototype. This is a picture of it. The problem they had was number one, they didn't know how to make an LED screen to be able to show the data. They didn't have processor chips to be able to know how to gather the calculation and what to do with them with the instruction set. They didn't have power supplies, which was one of the biggest problems, where they couldn't figure out how to keep power regulated to be able to keep the information not just go away. So they had to get to a point where they had people who made keys screens, power supplies, processors. This particular device had 24 tubes. And that was the, we'll think of it as 24 bit to be able to do all those calculations. So inside HP, uh, they, uh, Hewitt said, okay, well, if you get a chance, think about how we could do this. But he didn't push the concept. But by 1968, they finally came up with the, with the capability to be able to make the first calculator. But the rules that they were given to be able to make it said it had to be the size of a typewriter so it could fit over here in Hewlett's desk. Because in those days, we had the typewriter that came out of the desk with the side panel that popped out. And if it wouldn't fit in that, you know, it wouldn't make the mark of what they were trying to accomplish. So when they finally made the first version of this, they went to bring it to Hewlett to put it in his desk, and it didn't fit. It was a quarter of an inch or half an inch too big. So they had a carpenter come in in the middle of the night and shave off his desk on the inside so it would fit. And therefore, it was accepted. And this first calculator for HP went on sale at 68 for $4,900.
And the next thing that he would say is, well, now can you make one I can hold in my hand? So they did. And it took until 1972. And that's when HP made its first handheld calculator. Uh, and it was called the HP 35. It was a scientific calculator and had all those trigonometry and, and uh, quadratic equation type functions right in there. And that's this. This was you know, different from anything that had ever existed before in the handheld. And it was $400. And uh, then they decided, okay, let's make another one that's financial functions. So it looked pretty much the same, but it was also $400. But then they realized something else. They didn't have a way to sell these products. So the, all they could do was put it in high-end bookstores or college bookstores and have them available. Maybe in those days, it was a Marshall Fields. But most of them were sold where people would write in to say they want a demonstration and the salesman from the HP staff had to come door to door to be able to sell these products. We take it for granted that anybody today that, you know, of course we could go on the internet and do it, but things back then were very limited because lifestyle was different. In 1973, a year later, they made the next version. The next version was a programmable calculator, the HP 65. It was an RPN language. They call it first published notation. And basically, it, it changes. It's a different way of uh, when you enter a piece of data, when do you press enter? But basically, it had these little strips here. And maybe the strips, I'm not sure how much data they held, uh, probably. 1K or something like that uh, of data. And you could put the strip in and it had programs on it. And when you put it in there, you, effectively that gave you the understanding of was this button and this program works, was this button, it was function keys, things we take for granted today. But back then that was unheard of. And by putting the strip in, it read the programs that were on there and therefore change the data, the, the function of how things work. And this was the first programmable calculator uh, and really changed things. And I heard stories that I'm not sure are true or not, that this calculator went up with the astronauts as a backup device to be able to uh, handle things that they couldn't get other computers to work. The next thing they did was they made the same thing in this big vending machine type version. And um, at that time, they, I was involved with HP and they called me in to be a consultant in Loveland, Colorado to be able to talk about this device. In the accounting world, this free calculator was the standard of how uh, people did things. For instance, if you did a financial report and you wanted percentages of the total on every line, you would run it through this type of a calculator where it would do the division to be able to come up with the answer. And of course, it was very fancy. A lot of different uh, people had a learning process, but it was also loud and <coughs> had the way with gears over and over and over and over for maybe three, four, or five minutes until it came up with the answer. So HP made this version called the HP 81. And I was a consultant on some of that. And that was the bigger version. And it popped out an anding machine tape, which gave you depreciation schedules, loan amortization schedules, uh, all kinds of financial functions which were needed. Years later, they took this and they put it in this little uh, HP 12C, which is financial functions. And that came out in 1981, and it's still sold today. It's still the standard. And if you were in real estate, this was the learning tool that you had to use to pass the test for real estate to be able to uh, 
um, do financial calculations. Another time, over time, they made another version of this, which was a calculator version that had a paper tape printed out, and it did all the financial functions as well. I was a speaker for that when it was announced uh, here in Chicago. The, um, so these were tools that made it solve the problem, made an answer, but that wasn't enough. In 1972, they came up with something that was a programmable calculator this size. And the programmable calculator had a 19K operating system, 8K of memory. It had a display screen that showed 32 characters, but scrolled over so you could see 80 if it was longer on its LED screen. Because by then they learned how to make LED screen. The 64K cassette over here, so 64K of data was for storage of programs. And um, they built a thermal printer, came out of the top, which used thermal paper. And um, I met the guys who were the engineers who made that. The biggest issue for that was how to keep the paper straight. And apparently they figured out how to make the roller so it was bowed in the middle, which forced the paper not to go off to the sides and jam. So it's always interesting as to how things work behind the scenes. Um, now, along with this, they made a, had a daisy wheel printer. And I don't know if you remember daisy wheel printers or not, but it was a wheel, a um, circle wheel with spokes. And each spoke had a key on it. And the way the printer worked is, it spun around and poked the, the, the sprocket with the letter on it through a ribbon and onto the page, the ink cage. So there was a, there were different wheels you can get with different fonts. And that was how early printers worked. Um, they also made plotters. Now HP was known for plotters because not only did they make them for their own systems, but probably any type of computer, large or small, who wanted a plotter to use an HP plotter. And they were started out with one pen and later went to four pens and made all kinds of plotting systems. And even today, there's a whole part of HP which makes 3D, large 3D printing devices that probably make a wall. So, so that's a whole other version of the company today. But it all started with a one pen plotter like this. The pen sat on the bar, it moved back and forth and moved up and down based on where it was on the page and drew things out in a graphics programming language. It was all uh, something that HP developed. Now, um, when it came to 1974, uh, I got involved heavily in this product, they came out with a hard disk capability where you had big time, two and a half megabytes on this big white platter. And another similar one built in with another two and a half megabytes. So it was possible to store five megabytes on this $17,000 hard drive, which was better than the cassette, which hit 64K. Along with that, they added some things like uh, matrix math, uh, string capability to print text, uh, a number of different functions that they added to the inside uh, features they had to the computer, along with the 16K memory. And they expanded it a bit so you could get a line printer. A line printer printed 30, 132 characters, had sprockets on each side, and you could get carbonized forms and turn them through this line print. It also had card readers. So if people had punch card input, they could stack them up, and it would read through the cards and, and get them into the system. And they even had a second cassette. Tape. So if you needed two cassettes, you could go back and forth, have one for data, one for programs, as you were using the system. 
My part of it had to do with creating a general ledger accounting system. It Locked up, Bert. The general ledger, and they were using this general ledger to be able to do it. Okay, in 1976, the next system was ready for expanding, going from an 8 bit computer, which was the first one, to a, 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 a 16 bit computer. And so while this interpretive basic language was there, it was the same language that was in the previous systems, and it was able to put it all into this smaller technology. Can you hear me? Hello? I can hear you. Okay. Um, it was able to go into this smaller technology with an eight inch floppy drive, which was certainly 1.2 megabytes, which was big time compared to the 64K capability before. And it also had a little cartridge tape here. And that cartridge tape was also, uh, not sure the size, but I used it in programming a lot to be able to uh, make systems where they didn't have a floppy disk. It was just all built into the single device. It still had the, uh, the 32 character, 80 character, 80 character capability on the screen. And it was basically built in the same, had a different set of keys, uh, keyboard, you know, they were more, not uh, more like an IBM typewriter where you push down, it was more of a touch key capability. So they sold this as a 9896 system as a, on a desk, it had a special custom made desk. It had the, the, uh, the hole for the printer that had the paper pass through behind the floppy disks. And uh, it was a very popular system at that time. It sold much less. The original system was $40,000. This one only was $25,000. Moving right along, um, one of the things that I had insisted when I got involved in making systems for HP was that in accounting, we always needed to be able to move our data forward. Moving our data forward what meant that uh, if you had accounting data and you moved to the next system up, you had to be able to bring the system data being usable, both in programs or in data. You couldn't just throw away your previous accounting as many systems did. And in this particular system, they made a special cable interface to be able to move data from one to the other from the previous system to this one. Um, I also did consulting to train the salespeople in accounting to be able to market the system. From this uh, HP, uh, we, we made a marketing plan for HP for business systems, and they started a whole new division of the company to be able to have business computers business computer division of HP. Um, all right. In 1976, when that one came out, they, um, and they did, we met with uh, HP, and they decided uh, they wanted to know what should be the next system. And so um, I was asked to design what I thought would be the next system that would be the perfect small business system at that time. This was 1976. So I drew on a napkin, I've told other stories about people drawing things on a napkin. I drew it on a napkin and showed them what I thought the system should be. I had different things that I had seen and it kept me interested to see what was good and what was bad. So if you look over here in this small window. This was the IBM System 32 
had this tiny little screen and it didn't move. And clients I, I knew that uh, had one were never comfortable with because the screen couldn't see it and it was, couldn't be moved and it was all built into the system. So one of the things that was a major concept that I had was to build this CRT on a screen that was on a post that could move in any direction. It could move back and forth along the device that could turn in any direction and was much more functional. So that was one piece of advantage that I suggested. Another one, of course, was to bring everything forward that we had before. So that was the stuff from the 9896 system, the same language, same programs, to be able to carry them forward. This particular was device, well, let me go on here a little bit more. Um, okay, uh, let's see here. All right. Um, so basically I said, in addition to the CRT, I wanted to render function keys on the CRT. In the old systems, we would have function keys and the way that you would be able to work something was you would put a little overlay over the keys. And then when it, you finish that program or a different part of the program, you put an overlay. So you knew what the function keys did. So what I wanted them to do was make programmable function keys on the screen. And that's what they did here. You can't see it in this screw, but you see the layer where there are actually buttons at the bottom of the screen that match the eight function keys that are programmably changing on the screen so that you can know what it is you're pressing. Now, they were duplicated on the keyboard as well, but it certainly made it much easier to understand what the programs were doing and what to do next in the program. So, programmable function keys, they made this super uh, fiberglass desk inside here, in the bottom was a Winchester disk drive. It was the first time hard disk drive started to come out. This particular one was 10 megabytes, which didn't seem like a lot today, but at the time that was a big deal. It probably about $10,000. Uh, here were two eight inch floppy disk drives and a drawer that came out for different devices. It was a matching printer stand and it could use well, any printer that uh, HP made along with it. They expanded this to be able to handle up to 15 users. And there were cable connections in the back here to be able to do that. So you could have 15 different terminals uh, working the system at the same time uh, using the, the hard drives, etc. That's what I asked them for, but they put one more thing in that I didn't know about. This particular picture is a picture of their HP 3000 computer desk that had built into it a, an image database. The HP image database system, which is what the HP 3000 computers, the big computers, used. And they put that system built into the operating system. It was added to the operating system. So it wasn't a matter of there was another program to run. It was part of the operating system. So we had something that I don't think exists today, an operating system that included a built-in database. And it included query forms, reports, writers, all, all the regular stuff that we take for granted. And that was all brought forward from the HP 3000 system into this new HP 250 system. We also had a graphics language, so you could do priors terminal languages uh, and, and different kinds of external monitors. Now, for instance, there was an external monitor where I could talk to a system, an IBM system, as an example. It could emulate um, PC systems to be able to talk back and forth. Uh, I wrote a system once uh, with the terminal communications that could get stock loads for a time uh, or be able to get into uh, BBS systems at the time. So there were lots of capabilities built into this HP 250 computer. And uh, 
Again, it was the same price as the one before. HP was uh, um, expanding in different ways and they opened up a factory in England. So the HP, first HP 250 computer was given to the Queen of England to keep track of the database for her personal horses, which was cool. Well, except for they didn't let me go to England with them to do it. Uh, at that time, HP was doing marketing and they would have this what if. And uh, there was a commercial where there was somebody in a driving in a little desert or something, stopped at a pay phone, and he's talking, picks up the phone and, and starts talking to a client and says, what if, with the idea that, you know, they had ideas and different ways of doing things. Years later, I couldn't get what if, but I did have what if you, and that's my license plate for today, still today. This particular picture was my office. Uh, at the time, I had a mural of uh, standing on the moon looking back at the earth. And uh, this was my my own office and computer. Came with lots of manuals and this and things to go with. So I was saying before about function keys. So here you can see that right built into the bottom of this monitor were these function keys. And so, you know, where did they come from? Well, there were function keys that were in monitors before. They made monitors that uh, had printers, thermal printers built into the top of them. I know somebody who created a, a monitor like this and added a board inside that could uh, speak. And what they did is they had a, a phone book for somebody who was blind. And they put in the capability to be able to have him type something in or, or talk back and forth to the monitor to be able to find out information for phone numbers, which was pretty cool at that time. Um, here's a Again, a typewriter type printer and a line printer. And all this is the CRT and a push. It didn't stop there because it was too expensive to make this fiberglass desk. So they each brief tried to standardize and make everything in the same cases. So they came up with another version. It wasn't so fancy. That was all the next one. They called them HP 260, and it came in one of these cases. You could also get a second case that might be a 55 or 65 uh, megabyte hard drive. Sometimes we had more than one, and we we're able to deal with these systems um, with larger amounts of data because of it. Um, and, uh, so in 1979, the 250 came out. The public went to the plane, and um, um, you know, it had all the capabilities and new features that we had talked about. Now, I, a, I was a, a VAR, and we had a VAR group where we could sell these machines if we wanted to, or we could sell them as a group, <coughs> and I was the representative for the Midwest. There were six people who got together every quarter in Cupertino at the site of the Acres. <coughs> and at that time, well, I should say that today that site is where the headquarters of Apple are, where they built that big circle headquarters. That was the site previously of HP's factory. Although they had many factories, that was the headquarters that we would go to. In any case, the job of this bar group was to be able to make improvements to the product and pick new features to be added to the operating system each quarter. And um, so I would go out there and we would, you know, add different features, different printers, different capabilities to the system. Uh, and we worked with somebody by the name of Bob Frankenberg, who was vice president of HP, who had just previously been the person who developed the risk chips. Uh, 
operating system chips, and they were used in all the printers, for instance. Uh, so basically, they uh, we worked with him, and uh, that went on until about ninety. But he would then left HP since there was no place for him to move up. To, to Cheney was already uh, vice president, uh, and he went and became the president of Novell. If you remember, there was a time when Novell and um, um, Word Perfect all merged together. He became the president to run the company. And I can't exactly say that worked out well since they wound up losing a billion dollars, but it was a difficult position to be in. But anyway, so he was later the president of Novell, which was one of the major network operating system at the time. Other people evolved to become involved with uh, three count as an example. This was all early on in, in computing technology. Um, and so a lot of people moved on to all kinds of different positions. Five Maybe minutes, you, Bert. Pardon? Five minutes. Okay. One of the things that um, we got from here was that uh, They wanted to make a new laser printer, and laser printers were um, about twenty thousand dollars at the time, and they were going to make a new one that was going to be ten thousand. And I explained to them about how important it was to be able to make a laser printer for accountants, because when we would, for instance, print the tax forms, we would have to have six carbon papers every run one page or a batch and then switch paper and do it again and the paper would jam and all kinds of problems with that type of situation. But with a laser printer, you could print the form with the data already filled in and print as many copies as you wanted. And so pushing them a lot, I was able to get them to come out with the next laser printer at about $4,000 and then $2,500. And today you have laser printers at $100. 260 was the next one that came out, and uh, there was, again, a smaller version of the same thing. They even made another smaller one around the end of uh, 1990 uh, that just made the box smaller. They put less on there. They got a kick out of it because they sold at two different prices. Uh, and I asked, I met with the factory person from Germany, and I asked him what the difference was. And he said, well, we, we flip the switch, and that's the difference. The people sell at a higher price or a lower price. So life in terms of technology by companies is an interesting insight background in how things actually work, layer after layer, and things move forward into computing technology. So after that, I did, when uh, after window, uh, DOS came out, uh, I worked with HP New Wave. And I worked with uh, Microsoft when they came out with the Microsoft accounting system. Uh, but after three years, they gave up and uh, moved on to let QuickBooks take over the industry. That's, uh, yeah, what, where do you want me to go from here? Sorry? Pardon? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, what do you want me to do? You want me to cut off or what? Yeah, about four more minutes. Well, okay. Let me just show you some screens. Here's typewriters, data machines, how they evolve from nothing, from David John. Here's HP calculators, how they evolve. Here's telephones, how they evolve. Here's televisions, VCRs, cable streaming, how they evolve. Clocks and watches, including the HP01, which I have, which was the first calculator watch, which did dynamic calculation. So as time went on, it would multiply and you could have the meter running. There's radio technology. 
music and voice recording, video, movies, and streaming, copiers. We don't, you know, we take for granted copiers today, scanners. We have printers of all kinds. We have computer graphics. This particular picture was drawn by somebody on a digitizer and then printed out. Uh, it was done by an artist at a meeting uh, as a picture of me and then printed out. And that was cool. Um, electronic books, gaming, remember the speaking spell? Internet technology, now things at home. Uh, internet, social media all over the place. News and books. Started with Gutenberg. We have IBM, which has all of its stuff. If you remember the various technologies, I was there at the announcement of this IBM 5100, which competed with some of the stuff that we did later on. Uh, there's HP calculators and computer sets. Here's small business system sets. Here's HP printer sets. Here's HP. They made this first 16 line uh, calculator. Here's an Osborne. Here's a Compaq. Here's a Deck Rainbow. I used one of those for a long time. Different computers of different kinds. This particular HP 9875 had color graphic screens, thermal printer in. It was the expansion of all these other things. And then we got the handhelds. And so the 12C, this particular one does data uh, calculation in terms of uh, like decimal code and converting data. This was an HP 95, which was in its time, it was unbelievably good. They took the side, they made it and thought they'd sell 10,000. They sold 10,000 a month. This is taking my HP 9830 computer and put it in a handheld. and had strips that had about 1K on it or uh, one meg on it that you pulled through and did programming on that. But this was the same operating system in the 9830. Here you start having Jornadas where you had other handhelds. Then back uh, in the bigger systems, we had all the other HP devices. We had Apple computers of all kinds. We had Windows computers still today. We have all kinds of Windows versions that came up over the years from works to uh, Flippy to Bob. Um, we have Microsoft Surface computers today, some of which are not yet. Uh, we have all kinds of storage media because everybody wants to see punch cards. So here we are. All kinds of imaginable storage media that have come into play and chips to be able and chips to be able to make all these things happen over the years. So at that point, we're back to the future. Perhaps um, this is what things will be like in the future. I do know. <laughs> uh, or maybe they'll just be this card. Uh, but these, we still don't know where we're going. And all we can expect is it'll keep evolving. Doesn't mean it evolves that much. Just as a point of view, these are out of uh, magazines from the past. This was an Apple computer ad. This was an HP 9835 ad. This was a 9875 ad. And this was a Radio Shack ad. These were far ahead of all these other devices back in 78, 79. 79 is when the HP 250 came out. So that's where we're at. And uh, more than you wanted to hear, I guess, but that's technology. Oh, thank so you very much. You all have your own experiences of how you, what you grew up with, learning, and maybe other people can give their thoughts and experiences to share with us in the future on how they evolved learning technology and their experiences in it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Bert. Going to un. Just we'll stop screen sharing. Yes, stop screen mm -hmm. sharing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks again, Bert. You want to run a um, Q and A?
You have any questions? Do I run the Q&A session, Bert? Sure. Thank you. I have some random thoughts about things you said. What you meant for me to go through? Well, whatever. I'm happy to answer anything I can about people who had questions about what I presented. I have one question, if I may. Sure. In your binary table, didn't you miss eight? Forgive me for saying it that way. Well, the way they, they I mean, a, a, a byte, it had eight bits, but one was a control bit. You had one, two, four. The next character would be eight, would it not? Then 16. Yeah, isn't that what was in there? I'm sorry? I, isn't that what I had? No, you forget the eight. That's okay. I'm not trying to, not trying to make fault, but just, just clarifying. Well, there were only seven zeros, let's put it that way. But the eight was missing. Because the eighth bit was a control bit. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, there's no eight on it. Oh. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Not a problem. But very good. Very good presentation. Thank you very much. Okay. If I might, what a great presentation. Uh, and just so much history there. Yeah, and you were apparently a, a good part of it. And that's uh, made it very interesting as well. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Uh, I, I approached it uh, at, at a conference one time a little bit differently uh, because I didn't get into any of this uh, by design or, or by uh, avocation. I saw a nine-year-old kid playing with a Commodore pet in 1978 in an Olsen electronics store. And I said, if he can play with it, I can. I don't know what I'll ever do with it. And I brought, I bought it and took it home. And of course, there were no books, no magazines. There was no manual for it. I had no idea what I was going to do with it. And so I started buying magazines and typing in basic programs from these magazines and then trying to fix the, the typos so it would work. And that's how I learned basic language. And, and I put together uh, a presentation, and I'm going to put a link to it because it's out on YouTube, uh, on some of what I showed, where I showed some of the ads and so on, and some of the different computers I had taking uh, from the period from about 1978 on forward. Uh, and uh, I got into computer user groups in 1982 because I bought an Osborne and again, didn't have any idea what I was going to do with it and joined the Tampa Bay Osborne computer user group in, in Tampa. And we brought all those 28-pound luggable Osbournes to the uh, biology lab, which had the nice high counters and plugs on the top of the counters because it was a biology lab. And we were all able to plug them in and, and compare because everybody had the same software. And it was really a, a great way. And so many people shared information with each other that I got hooked on user groups and have been involved in user group uh, uh, communities now since 1982 because of that. And I'm going to put in the chat box a link to that video that I, that I did. Good. Thank you. Any other comments from anyone else? Questions? <coughs> Okay, let's open up a floor for our, uh, tips, tricks, and traps. Uh, open form. Any questions from anyone? Problems? We had two questions posed earlier in the evening. Um, Mark, where are you? Did Mark leave us? I guess Mark left us. Well, Dennis, you raised a question about the um, seniors. That was in the, the question you raised was based upon an email that was dated July 17th. Now, I don't have a copy of that on my, on my computer, but I do have a copy on my cell phone. And I, I can't transfer that into the to reader. But um, Jerry, you seem to know something about that email. Mm. Jerry, are you with us? <laughs> Anyone else have a, a knowledge of that email about um, seniors? 
it, uh, Beata circulated, um, distributed the men, the email about seniors programs. Yeah, it's called uh, techforsenior.com. Uh, uh, they what it is? It's a weekly program on Mondays. Uh, they started last March uh, with the pandemic, so they spend so much time. But each week there's another lesson. They're up to uh, <coughs> lesson 66. Um, they have like four different segments. Um, uh, but uh, I listened to a couple of them. One was talking about uh, uh, shopping uh, because of the pandemic. And uh, uh, it, it, it's not too much. Uh, and then they were talking about... Uh, uh, legal uh, stuff with. Um, Do you have a copy of the email, uh, Jerry? Jerry, you have a copy. You want to share it? You want to share your, You want to share it with us? Okay, I just put in the uh, uh, chat box a link to the Tech for Senior webpage, and I'll be glad to tell you a little bit about it if you'd like. Yeah, well, I, 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 go ahead. Yeah, I, I went out to it this week. Yeah. Well, let's 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 get Dennis's question raised first. Okay. Okay. Did, he raised a question about that email, the July seventeenth email. Well, I, I just I just didn't know how it um why why did I get it how how did it originate Is it CCS um put uh, CCS is advocating or I don't know how I got it or why. <laughs> Beata, Beata distributed to everyone. It's for CCS information and yeah. and for your reaction to it if, it if it interests you, okay? So if there's something on that in, uh, if that is of interest to you, it gives you an invitation to participate and how to participate. Oh, there's uh, a lot of seniors that are all concerned about the virus thing, so... Well, that's the topic, so, uh, Terry. So it's not a CCS group, and no. there's there's no dues to pay. It's no. just something you can go to if you want to. Kind of right. Thing. It's for your information to participate as you like. There's no dues, no information, no particip no no membership involvement. Participate we, as you like. They do have uh, some uh, sponsor ads in there, so it's not like uh, you know uh, it's for free to them. It's just in addition to some of the information that Tim sends out. Right. Yeah. Like they're up to 66 right now. Yeah. <laughs> If I remember the content, APCUG has a seniors uh, in that email that talks about a, a seniors program sponsored by APCUG. I remember, some, I noticed some of the names on it. Bill, um, well, some of the names of the of the speakers on there belong to APCUG. So, but again, it was an informational e email that um, if you see something that meet your fancy you're in, you're able to you're you're invited to participate as you like okay okay all right Hewlett, well, you want to register, they want your name and what computer club you're in. That's part of the registration. You you want to you want to you want to add to that? Yeah, it basically started uh, 
uh, when the COVID thing, when people who were, we started, had to start quarantining, uh, Ron Brown called me and said he had an idea of, of maybe doing something for seniors using Zoom so we could keep people still interested in technology uh, as, as a group for seniors and keep it on the, uh, on the positive side instead of talking about all of the things uh, and the reasons why we have to stay indoors. But if, more to uh, if we're going to stay indoors, let's talk about some technology and some, some interesting things and fun things. And I said, well, I'll only, uh, I, I like the idea and let's do it as a co- co-host. And we started it in March of last year. We've now had, uh, I think it's 68 or 69 weeks in a row we've done it. Uh, we do it via Zoom. And because we were filling the Zoom room, uh, we had, we could put 100 people in because we, we <coughs> filled it. In, and a lot of times before we even started the meeting, uh, we started doing uh, streaming on YouTube as well. And uh, we can we're continue it. Uh, I usually do some uh, sessions on some of the technology. I've been doing a whole series on uh, a Starlink, the uh, uh, Elon Musk uh, uh, satellites, uh, uh, beaming Wi-Fi. Uh, and, and I've got a, a whole series of them that are on YouTube now. Uh, and we've talked about uh, uh, other uh, pieces of software, or other devices, gadgets. We've talked about the uh, electronic vacuum cleaners. Uh, we've talked about Chromebooks. We've talked about uh, phones. Ron is a retired physician, so he's talked about a lot of the uh, the uh, the phones, the wrist phones, uh, the yeah, the wrist, uh, 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 the Apple Watch, the. Uh, and some of the other ones out there and, and some of the medicinal, uh, the medical things that they're being used for and what's coming and how to use them. So we're doing a lot of things, aiming it towards seniors, aiming it towards beginners. There is no fee. There's no advertising uh, on our Thursday program now that we're doing also. Uh, Avast is, is giving us some copies of their VPNs to give away. And we talk 30 seconds about them. Uh, other than that, and, and of course, Bob G., represents them. He doesn't work for them, but he kind of represents them, speaks to users group all over the country. And so he mentions Avast, but they're not really sponsoring the, the Tech for Senior. There's no cost. Uh, we did ask for some money uh, uh, if people wanted to donate uh, a $3 for a cup of coffee type of thing uh, to help pay for the, the Zoom licenses and some of the other licenses we have. But it's all free. Uh, we record all of them. All of them are up on YouTube. Uh, you can use them for any of your user group. A lot of the user groups are using either parts of them or the whole show as a, a part of a meeting. And uh, we're just trying to share with other seniors. Okay. Uh, and we're getting people from all over the U.S., Canada, and we got even a couple of people from Germany that join us. All right. Thank you. And, and there was all. Dennis, unmute yourself and repeat your, your comment. Everybody's been muted because and, there's some, and, there's some back, it, background noises coming through. And in my initial question, I also mentioned there was something about, and I think Jerry said it was Oklahoma uh, user group. I want to know what that was, too. Is it the same thing as the senior thing? or? Well, let's see if I can find that email. July 17. Forgive me, I'm trying to find that email. Sydney, Pet Plan, Embrace. CCS Comcast.
Uh, let's see how smart my computer is. Maybe I can show this email. If I can get, uh, da, 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 da. let's get this off screen and let's get. Now, this. That far. And I want messages, photos, apps. Nope, I can't. I didn't save it, so I can't do it. I was trying to uh, see if I could transfer this email to um, to my computer that I can show it on screen, but I can't. I can't do it in a very, very few minutes. So, so I don't want to bore you with sitting there watching me. Okay. Any other comments, questions, or um, new questions, new directions? Yeah, I don't know if any of you are aware, but uh, remember the Radio Shack color computer? I got involved with that way back in the early 80s when it came out. At one time, I had a couple of them, and I belong to a user group in the Chicago area here that still exists today, and they have monthly meetings, and uh, once a year, they have a, uh, a program, you know, a, a, a thing that's coming up this fall, so I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but it's uh, Glenside Color Computer Group. What, what is it exactly, Wayne? A car computer, did you say? The Radio Shack color computer <laughs> that came out in the in the 1980s. And it used, it used OS 9 operating system. And it was a basic, uh, it used a basic operating system. Originally, it started out, it had cartridge that you plug into the side. And it also ran on a, uh, a tape you know, a, a cassette tape program would be on a cassette tape. So people and, in this group are still using them? Yeah, and, and they're, they're still existing today. They, they meet once a month. What can you do on them? Well, they, they had basically were, were games to begin with. And, get, and some of these folks are still have uh, running these things now they they had several different versions of the of this Radio Shack color computer that came out. I had the first version, but I think they're up to like the third version. But uh, it's still uh, it still exists today. This group. In fact, I gave my color computer that I had. Uh, it was like two years ago I gave it to them. I donated it. I had it sitting around for, for many years. My wife kept yelling at me to get rid of it. So, Okay, any other com comments on this, on this topic? Okay, new question, new directions. Who's got a question or a comment or a suggestion or thoughts or idea that to invoke conversation? Questions? Bird, look like I cut you off too soon. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have any beginners in this group. Everybody, uh, we had one question that was posed and that question left so I don't know what what his, his question was about uh, uh, something about uh, uh, where he had a word question so he left so I don't know what his question was uh, computer history so anybody want to comment on the thing about the Chinese now hacking and uh, let's not get into politics I mean uh, you know we're getting that what do you think about uh, Microsoft uh, uh, computer in the in the cloud? 
if they announced it's going to be for businesses to start with, but eventually I'm sure it's going to trickle down to us as end users. Well, uh, the question, uh, there was a question raised by some people commenting about some of these announcements uh, as to whether or not Microsoft could afford to do it on the consumer level at any reasonable price per seat. Because as we all know, in businesses and in education, I, you can do a cloud desktop pretty easily because everybody's using the same apps and everybody's using the same, uh, the same customizations, the same features. But consumers are all over the place. We have different levels at which we operate. We have different applications. We like to customize different ways. We have different workflows. And uh, the other thing is they're probably going to run smack up against people asking, well, why don't we just continue with Chromebook and iPad? Because these do things in the cloud. They're not a true cloud desktop, but they do things in the cloud. A uh, question of anybody in this uh, group, would you want to have a cloud desktop from what you know about it? No, I wouldn't. Really? Does that mean that all of my data and anything I create is just in the cloud, but not local at all? Is that what that means? As with one drive, you could download, but you would not be able to use the full power of the apps once your subscription is no longer paid for. Mm -hmm.